Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me once again for the launch of our third ETF in 2021 and our 13th overall ETF as part of Signia's Artrix range. This morning, we'll be focusing on the latest listing, which is the Signia Artrix Selective Healthcare 150 ETF. It has launched today. It is available for trading. And I will unpack both the healthcare sector as an investment and why we believe healthcare is an attractive sector at the moment. And I will also unpack the ETF itself, what you can expect to see as some of the top holdings, what the performance has been like of this index historically, so we can unpack it. As per usual, if you have any questions, please do type them into the question box. And depending on how much time we have left, after I have finished presenting, I will answer the questions that I am able to in the time permitted and anything else that I do not get to today live in the webinar, I will answer you directly over email. So before we get into the healthcare sector and the actual ETF and what this ETF is about, I will, as per usual, just cover some normal educational content around ETFs, and I will try to go through it relatively quickly. So an ETF, for those that may not be familiar, ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. Essentially, a simple way to think about it, it's just like a unit trust but it trades on a stock exchange. So you're able to buy it and sell it on the stock exchange. ETFs are governed by the same Cisco regulation, so the Collective Investment Schemes Control Act. An ETF itself is one instrument, but it's composed of a basket of securities or assets and seeks to mirror the performance of an index. These underlying assets could be shares, they could be bonds, they could be the ETF could be tracking a single commodity like gold or platinum. How will you know if the ETF has performed well? Well, other than being able to look at the performance on a regular basis, the performance of the ETF is determined by the performance of the underlying assets. So if you had to be tracking the S&P 500 index in your ETF, if the S&P 500 index has gone up and has done well, then the performance of the ETF would be good as well. The opposite is also true. In down markets, if you're investing in a certain ETF that tracks a certain index that um, over a certain period has not done well, then the ETF will also not perform well over that period. So to visually put it into a simple um, representation, an ETF is essentially, if you look on the left of this little napkin diagram, it's a collection of assets. These could be bonds, they could be stock, or it could be a single commodity. Most ETFs, replicate the performance of an index. And the one main difference between ETFs and unit trusts is that ETFs can be bought and sold throughout the day, whereas mutual funds trade once a day. Those would be your more traditional unit trusts. Now, if you look at all the ETFs in the industry globally and locally, you get many, many types of ETFs. And this industry is constantly evolving and there's new ways to track certain things in the market. So you get index ETFs, index tracking ETFs, which is what we're talking about this morning, an ETF that tracks a certain index. You get commodity ETFs, as I mentioned, you could buy one ETF that tracks the price of a commodity such as gold. So while your ETF could track the gold performance, um, Outside of South Africa, globally, you also have actively managed ETFs. You have industry ETFs. You could almost, I mean, what we're talking about today, we're talking about healthcare. Healthcare is an industry. And there's ETFs that can track that very niche industry, such as healthcare. So you have many, many ETFs, ones that can track foreign markets outside of South Africa or a certain market like a Japanese ETF bond ETFs, certain style ETFs, there's many, many different types of ETFs out there. Just some history, ETFs have been around for many years, more than 30 years. The first one um, goes dates back to 1990 in Canada, it was the Toronto Index Participation Fund, and that was created and introduced really to track the larger stocks. Um, 
And in 1993, S&Ps and their depository receipts, that was really seen as the true birth of the ETF industry in the early 90s. And if you look at this timeline, you know, in the late 90s, it was adopted in Asia, early 2000s in Europe. And as time has gone on, we are now sitting in a situation where there's so many different ETFs all around the world. And as an investor, the more ETFs there are, the better it is for us, as we now have options to track very niche sectors, very broad world indices. There's really anything that you may have an interest in as a subsector um, or part of an economy or a certain country that you may believe will grow over the next couple of years. There's so many options for us as investors to be able to find an ETF that really is suitable for the kind of exposure that we want to um, have in our portfolios. And this um, graph really just shows us since the early 2000s how the assets and the management of the global ETF industry have just continued to rise as investors become more and more comfortable with what an ETF is, how these instruments operate, what they track, how efficient they are, how low cost they are. There's many, many benefits to using ETFs. And now institutional and individual investors are investing more and more money in these, uh, you know, very simple and um, very beneficial instruments. So by the end of 2020, you can see that there's so many, um, you know, assets that have uh, flowed into different um, ETFs. And this chart really shows us uh, the growth of the industry as a whole to the end of um, last year. And this is set to continue to grow as new products are, are developed um, and um, the industry is finding these new products attractive, more and more money flows into uh, ETFs globally. So all very, very exciting and definitely not something that's new. As I said, ETFs have been around since the early 90s. And um, even in South Africa, ETFs have now been around for more than 20 years. So we see that so much money is flowing into ETFs. So why is that? Well, there are many, many benefits. And one of the biggest benefits is cost. Many good ETFs have very low fees, whereas a lot of very interesting uh, portfolios that are actively managed, especially if um, it's asset managers that manage monies for, uh, for global assets, or as I said, in a very niche sector, such as be it emerging markets or a very healthcare focused fund, any of those portfolios could cost uh, a lot. They could cost two and a half percent of a total expense ratio if they're actively managed, whereas a lot of the ETFs are just a couple of uh, basis points. So a lot of good ETFs, very low fees. The access is pretty easy for investors. You can choose whether you want to invest via the Signia platform, um, any other platform that has um, a lot of ETFs available, um, or you can choose to invest through your stockbroking account. And of course, when it comes to international um, indices, so as a South African investor, if you invest into any of the ETFs available through the stock exchange um, or through various platforms, if that ETF is tracking a global index, so for example, the MSCI World, the S&P 500, or MSCI Japan, any foreign markets, it's a great benefit for South African investors to be able to sit in South Africa invest through local platforms or the local exchange, but get, gain that global exposure that is great for diversifying your portfolio. And you are able to gain that global access without having to worry about truly externalizing your money and worrying about exchange control. So there's many other benefits, but these are really some of the main ones. And for me, the main ones is that it's a ETFs are low cost uh, vehicles, and we know that costs ultimately eat away at your investment return over the long term. So the less that you pay for an investment product, the more of the return um, you can keep for yourself. And just on fees, this is a slide that we use in a lot of our webinars in various different topics, but it really is a, a powerful way 
to show the impact of high fees. So these numbers were prepared by uh, National Treasury, and they really what they show is if you are able to reduce the charges on a retirement fund account. And the reason why we're using or they use retirement fund account is, of course, we know in a retirement fund members are invested for the long term. A lot of young members that enter into a retirement fund will be invested for 30, 40 years before they eventually retire. So it really is about that long-term investment horizon. And if you're paying really high fees over the long term, the compounding effect of what you could have had as a higher net return had you paid lower fees is simply massive over the long term. So the findings by National Treasury were that if a regular saver is able to reduce the charges of the investment portfolio in a retirement fund from two and a half to half a percent of assets annually, their benefited retirement would be 60% greater after 40 years. So that is very, very powerful how much more you can get out of your investment accounts if you manage to pay low fees. And two and a half percent to half a percent, so um, being able to cut your investment fees by two percent does sound like a lot, but as I've mentioned, I've done my own research just quickly online to see the type of funds you get out there, and especially when it comes to global funds, and especially when it comes to more niche um, sectors or certain region regional funds, some asset managers are charging ridiculous fees um, that are very close to the two and a half and three percent um, fees. So it is very much doable uh, to be able to cut your investment fees by about two percent. And why Signia's ETF? So there's many providers in South Africa. They all have uh, you know, great offerings. But the way we manage our ETFs, we truly believe that um, we manage the ETFs in a very cost efficient manner. We manage all of the underlying holdings ourselves. Uh, so not using feeder, feeder funds in any of these 13 ETFs that we have on offer. So the tracking efficiency is there. We work with a very big and very well-known market maker called Jane Street, and they, uh, you know, assist us and provide it results essentially in tight spreads and very deep markets for our investors. And more importantly, Signia has a very long-term track record of managing passive solutions. So we have a long history of indexation. And right back in 2003 was when we fully replicated um, equity indices such as the SWIX and the All Share Index. And you can have a look at this timeline, but you know, since 2003, we have developed you know, many products in the passive space. And back in 2016, five years ago now, is when we actually started not just looking at your traditional asset classes and traditional indices, but that is really back then that we started thinking about thematic investing and um, looking at creating products on a passive and low cost basis that can give our investors exposure to very exciting things. And the whole story about thematic investing really is about looking at various themes forward looking where you believe that theme will result in growth over the long term. So it's identifying certain key areas in the markets that you believe will grow um, over the next couple of years. And a good example of that historically has been tech. So if you think of our fourth industrial revolution fund and all of these new technologies, um, it really is about being the early investors into that type of a theme. All of these new technologies about exploring space, for example, or artificial intelligence. And since then, we have continued to innovate. In 2020, we launched um, our Health Innovation Global Equity Fund. And in 2021, as I mentioned when I started this presentation, this is the third ETF launch of the year. The first one that we launched was the S&P uh, Global 1200 ESG ETF. So it's a good 
global portfolio, but with that ESG element, whereby all of the underlying holdings tick the boxes in terms of ESG. Then we launched our Emerging Markets ETF, very much focused on these growth regions of the Asian economies that are set to grow the most over the next couple of years. And today we launch our healthcare ETF. Again, another theme that we feel very strongly about in terms of growth prospects over the next couple of years. And if you look at our um, options of you know, these 13 ETFs that we have on offer, we are the largest provider of international index tracking ETFs that are listed on the JSC. And most importantly, so I've told you about what ETFs are, I've shown you how they've really grown um, in the global industry over the last couple of years. They really make sense for investors because they are so efficient, they're very low cost, uh, the international um, exposure ones can give you that global access without um, exchange control. But as I have said, passive investing just makes sense. You are investing in a product with low management fees. The performance has been phenomenal of passive against active, um, both globally and locally. There's so many themes and options. As I mentioned, you know, especially you know, globally and here in South Africa, you can find many good ETFs that track very exciting uh, themes or industries. And because these instruments are able to be bought and sold throughout the day, if you wanted to get exposure to healthcare today, you can buy the ETF today and get that immediate efficient implementation of that theme into your portfolio. And as you saw, um, the growth of the sector has been phenomenal and top investors worldwide are opting for uh, passive solutions. As I mentioned, from a cost perspective and performance perspective, it simply makes sense. And these investors are not just individuals and a, a lot of big institutions are also following a passive approach to money management. And interestingly enough, if you look at the US market, which is simply massive in terms of investment, back in 2005, that doesn't seem all that long ago. If you look at the vertical axis, it will show you the percentage of monies that was managed passively and the percentage of US monies that was managed actively. And back in 2005, about 85% of the total US funds were managed actively and only 15% passively. But as time has gone on, you can see that there's less and less active management and more and more passive management. And now in 2021, about half of these total assets uh, managed in America are managed on a passive basis. So it's not to say that, you know, we don't believe in active management at all, but what we truly believe in is that passive management is a must in your portfolio, even if it is just a portion of your portfolio that you can access low cost and efficiently. And we know with active managers, even if you had to choose to say, I really rather want to invest in an active manager and I trust rather the Alan Grays and the coronations of the world, that's all good and well. A lot of them have phenomenal performance, but then you have another decision. So you've made the decision to go active. You have accepted that you will pay higher fees for the money management of your portfolio. But then you have to think, well, which manager am I going to choose? And it's not such an easy decision. And this chart shows you how not every manager is at the top of the ranking tables from a performance perspective every year. As these managers' portfolios go through market cycles, some are more focused on valuations, other ones are more focused on growth, they follow different styles and processes and philosophies. They also really try to differentiate themselves from one another. No one wants to be seen as doing the exact same thing as the next one. And for those reasons that they try to differentiate themselves and they have different views of the world, you can expect their performance to be very, very different. So in this little chart, we're showing you how if you had to invest with Alan Gray, how consistent their performance would be. And I'm by no means picking on them. They are a lovely manager, great manager, but 
unfortunately, they cannot be at the top of the ranking tables the whole time. One year they're in the middle, next year at the top, then they're at the bottom, and that goes for many, um, in fact, most of these asset managers. So that's the other decision and the other difficulties that you might be paying very high fees, but not have uh, top performance. So another reason why passive management just simply makes sense. Now, I mentioned that we have 13 ETFs in total as of today that are listed on the local exchanges. Now, if you look on the right hand side, we only have two local equity funds. So both track uh, South African equities. The one is the Signia Artrix Swix 40 ETF and the other one is the Signia Artrix Top 40 ETF. But now if you look on the left hand side, as I mentioned, we are a provider of international ETFs and we have the other 11 from our Artrix range are all tracking global indices. Now the top is more of your regional fund so they're focused on either a certain region or the whole world and if we quickly go through them the first one they on offer is the Signia Artrix MSCI World ETF. So this ETF will give you exposure to the world very largely weighted towards the US, but there is exposure to other developed uh, countries and regions such as the Eurozone. Then the second one is the Eurostox 50. So this ETF will give you exposure to the 50 largest, most liquid stocks um, listed in the Eurozone. MSCI Japan, which is the third one there, this would give you exposure to the Japanese equity market. The MSCI US will give you exposure to the US market. The FTSE 100 is the UK market. The S&P 500 is the 500 largest stocks listed on US exchanges. Then this S&P 1200 ESG ETF, this is the one that we launched in April. So we don't have a very long-term track record. However, the index does have a long-term track record. If you wanted to see how the index has performed, it's been around for quite a number of years. But this ETF gives you global exposure predominantly developed market, but there is about 5% exposure to emerging markets. So it's truly global exposure to both developed and emerging markets. And each one of these companies have, has had to tick the boxes in terms of ESG before they can be included in the index. And then the ETF that we launched um, also this year um, in May was the Emerging Markets ETF. And this ETF from a regional exposure perspective, very much focused, um, it's the largest 50 stocks listed in emerging markets, but on a look through basis, heavily weighted towards China and Asian economies. So very exciting from a growth perspective. And then the other three you could view as specialist funds. So they're focused on more of a niche sector. And the first one there that we have is the Signia Artrix Global Property Fund. This ETF tracks the performance of the 40 largest, most liquid developed market property companies. So it gives you exposure to global property essentially. Then our very popular fourth industrial revolution fund. So this one is focused on all of these future technologies such as the space exploration, the artificial intelligence, the uh, 3D printing, so it's all of these exciting uh, technologies that are really and truly driving the fourth industrial revolution. And then the newest one that's launched today is the Signia Artrix Solactive Healthcare 150 ETF. Now, from a performance perspective, before we start unpacking healthcare and what this specific ETF is all about. From a performance perspective, as you can see, all of these ETFs have done quite nicely. The ones that are not included in this table are the three new ones. We don't have any long-term track record for them as yet. Um, but you can see from the one-year numbers, especially you can see you know, positive returns across the board with the fourth industrial revolution fund being the star performer over the one year. Now let's get into healthcare. So before we look at what you can expect of the actual ETF, we already know from the name of the ETF that it's a healthcare ETF. So why is healthcare attractive as an investment? Well, first and foremost, everybody needs healthcare. If you don't need healthcare right now, 
then unfortunately you will most likely need healthcare at some point. And we know that whenever everybody needs something, it is a huge opportunity for investors. We are also seeing that there are aging populations around the world. People are living longer and longer. In fact, some experts are saying that most 30 year olds today will live to 130. So people are able to live longer and longer. But this is all thanks to the advancements in med medicine. So as we see medical advancements as we have been over the past couple of years and we yet to see more and more advancements in healthcare going forward, Medical professionals are able to diagnose you a lot quicker. People wear all sorts of devices that can alert them if something is wrong. And by being able to detect a certain sickness or you know, a certain disease early, uh, more often than not, if you start treating it early, it does ex extend your life expectancies. There are also a lot of medications that can make you know, some of the diseases of older people more comfortable. Uh, less pain for them and they're able to live longer and longer. So it's really thanks to medical advancements that people are living longer and longer. So that in itself um, also makes um, healthcare attractive from an investment. But healthcare is expensive. So we have seen that the cost of healthcare is high all over the world. And it is a massive issue that governments cannot solve alone. Companies that are continuously thinking and innovating in the healthcare space, trying to make certain devices cheaper, certain medications cheaper, as this research and development goes on. The companies that are able to succeed in making certain procedures or medications cheaper are only likely uh, to benefit. Then if you think about the healthcare sector, it has traditionally been seen as defensive. But as the healthcare theme has evolved, a lot of healthcare companies today are at the forefront of technological innovation. And the healthcare sector today is really providing investors with exciting growth opportunities through the market cycle. And I didn't want to start with this, but we do still find ourselves in a pandemic. And the pandemic alone has highlighted how unequal healthcare is around the world. It has highlighted how unprepared certain governments were for this pandemic. And it has really thrown a new spotlight onto the industry. We have also seen you know, the positives of this focus on healthcare and how phenomenal is it that when all the bright minds of the healthcare industry are focused on the same goal, how quickly they can develop certain things such as the vaccines for COVID-19. So we cannot forget that, of course, we are still in a pandemic. A lot of these healthcare companies are set to benefit from uh, you know, vaccines that they've developed for this pandemic, for you know, things that they're still working on, for treating the disease, and um, governments and or experts are warning governments that the next pandemic might not be a hundred years away. So if you think back to the Spanish flu being about a hundred years, that was a true global pandemic that spread all over the globe. Then a hundred years later, as we've seen this COVID-19 pandemic spread all over to every country. So we can expect these things to happen from time to time, but experts are warning that it, they might not be a hundred years between this pandemic and the next pandemic, the next one might come a lot sooner, meaning that government spend towards healthcare is only set to increase so that they can be prepared um, the next time something like this comes around. And spending on healthcare is massive as a percentage of GDP. It currently accounts for about 10 and a half percent of global GDP. So a lot of money is spent on healthcare by individuals, by companies, by governments. And this spend is only set to grow, and it's expected to grow at an annual rate of about 5%, reaching over $6 trillion by 2028. So this industry is just growing. Mergers and acquisitions remain a key theme. They're also driving expansion into the industry. And I already mentioned innovation, but there's so much innovation happening in the healthcare space. It is so exciting. And companies are involved in many, many very futuristic and exciting kind of projects in the healthcare space. 
and the fundamentals overall for a lot of these companies that are very well diversified in many different sectors is looking really good. And let's think back to ourselves as South African investors. It really is an attractive sector for South African investors to be able to gain some exposure to global healthcare in your portfolio. And healthcare is also a rather limited uh, sector in terms of availability in South Africa. So if you look at, you know, the companies that you can buy, if you had to say, okay, I want some exposure to healthcare, let me have a look at what stocks are available in the JSC. Well, there's a couple of hospital groups, there's Aspen, but there's not enough of them to give you that truly diversified portfolio. So by having this ETF on offer, we truly believe that you can gain that good healthcare exposure to the true leaders in the space, in the global space, and you can have exposure to that theme in your portfolio. And the performance has been phenomenal. A few facts about healthcare. The market cap of the five largest global healthcare companies outstrips the whole size of the JSC. That's how huge some of these global pharmaceutical companies are. They have massive profit margins, anywhere between five and 95%, depending on you know, what sector they are in and how much competition there is in that sector. And the demographics of the world are changing. As we said, people are living longer and longer and requiring a lot more um, healthcare. The research and development that is happening in the space, as I mentioned, simply phenomenal. You can do your own research as well. If you see some of these companies that I will highlight, you can just you know, go onto their websites. They all have these innovation centers. They all have these massive product pipelines of what they uh, you know, trying to get approved at the moment, what is in phase one trial, what is in phase two trial, and some of the medications, devices, and you know, all of these healthcare related innovations are just simply phenomenal and they will really change the way um, we see healthcare in the next couple of years. And of course, there's many benefits to improving healthcare. And healthcare affects productivity and productivity affects GDP growth, essentially. So as here's just a few interesting stats of in a typical year, what poor health would cost the economy. And it's simply huge. The very exciting part for me is not so much the COVID-19 pandemic, not so much the fact that we're going to live until we are 130 and need to take a whole lot of medication in order to be able to live that long. For me, the most exciting part about healthcare is really just the, the innovation. And these are just some of the top healthcare innovations that are already available. And I have no doubt that if we had to have the same presentation next year, this time, uh, this list would look totally different. So if we go through some of them, I mean, now we can do next generation sequencing, simply phenomenal. 3D printed devices. So 3D printers, uh, it's mind blowing that a 3D printer can, you know, simply print a device, but even beyond just 3D printing devices, which can be very low cost. What does this practically mean for the healthcare sector? Well, many years ago, maybe you would go to your GP, you wouldn't be able to test for certain things. Maybe he would suspect one or two things that may be wrong with you, and he would send you to various specialists so you can go for the various tests or scans. Now, with 3D printing and with the lower cost, you know, as technology develops, the cost comes down. And with the lower cost, a lot of physicians' offices have many different testing facilities, uh, and maybe your GP can now simply test uh, for simply test or scan or do a lot more in terms of a full body checkup than before. But even more exciting in the 3D printing space is not just the devices, but the fact that they are able to 3D print human tissue. Um, that again is just mind blowing and it is almost futuristic to think that uh, human tissue uh, can be printed on a 3D printer. Then immunotherapy, another exciting technology for treatments, especially in cancer patients. It can extend their survival. They can live a lot longer with 
immunotherapy relative to uh, chemotherapy and have a lot less side effects. So it really is a game changer for a very serious disease that affects the lives of uh, you know, many people and is a disease that is known for you know, each individual, um, unfortunately, knows someone that um, has or is suffering with the disease. Then artificial intelligence. I mean, artificial intelligence has made its way into every sector and healthcare is no different. Now we know that computers can be less biased than humans. They can think a lot faster. They operate a lot more efficiently and artificial intelligence is used for diagnostics and it can really diagnose a patient with a much higher speed and accuracy than a human. So again, simply phenomenal where technology is going. And then these points of care diagnostics, as I mentioned, uh, you can go to your doctor's office, maybe they prick your finger, they do a little test, but they can do so many tests on various things now at the actual physician's office without you having to go um, to um, other places. Virtual reality, those VR, glasses that people can put on a lot of the time for games and for very exciting things, but they're also used in medicine. So firstly, these um, virtual reality can be used to simulate training environments. So if we had to all train to be surgeons, we could put those glasses on and uh, actually see what the inside of the human body looks like. We can see with a lot of accuracy and precision exactly where, uh, you know, maybe somebody's getting cut and something is getting cut out of their body. So to visually be able to, you know, teach the future doctors what they can expect on a day to day when they do start operating is phenomenal. And also, Virtual reality is also used for patients. So if I'm a patient and my doctor is trying to explain to me exactly what he's going to do, I can also put those on and he can literally take me through my own body and show me how he will cut there and make a little incision there. So it really has changed the game in terms of the way we view uh, medical procedures. And then I'm pretty sure that most of you listening to me today have some type of a tracking device, or some type of a watch. A lot of these watches can tell you oxygen levels, which is very uh, topical in COVID-19. If you've had, if you have been sick, you will know that you have to um, monitor your oxygen levels. Um, there's all sorts of uh, trackers that can detect if something is not right. Maybe your heart rate is too low. If that is the case, um, then you know something is not right. Maybe you call your physician. And then it goes beyond that. So there's chips that you can insert into your arm that can monitor your sugar levels. And the development from an innovation perspective in this space is also massive. Again, I have no idea what it will look like, but I'm pretty sure in 10 years time, we will have all sorts of devices and watches that can tell us a lot more about our bodies than even all the great information that we can already get today from some of these fitness devices. Now let's look at how healthcare has performed. So if you look at the horizontal axis, of this chart, you will see that this one only goes back to May 2017. That is how long the track record is of the index that we will track in this ETF. So this healthcare ETF, the Signia Artrix Selective Healthcare 150 ETF, will track the Selective Developed Markets Healthcare 150 index which is the darker line. So you can see that since 2017, it has moved very much in the same direction, which is up, which is great, um, as the MSCI world is just comparing how it would have performed relative to a very broad market, which doesn't just include healthcare. The MSCI world has a lot of exposure to information technology, to financials, to communication services, and healthcare is a portion. So you can see they move nicely in line. There's many periods where healthcare um, has outperformed, but looking at it over a four-year track record, we can see, yes, good performance. Yes, uh, it is bumpy. We do expect this when we're investing in any equity markets, not just healthcare, and the overall trajectory is up, but still quite short. So if we look for an index with a longer-term track record and a longer history, 
we can look at the MSCI World Healthcare Index. And again, relative to just the MSCI World, so the darker line is how healthcare has performed, whereas the broader line is just broad world equities that, yes, includes healthcare, but also largely weighted to information technology, financials, communication services, etc. And you can see that if you had to start measuring them since 2005, so a much longer track record, you can see that healthcare has actually performed phenomenally well over the long term, comfortably above uh, world equities over this period of about 16 years. So really great from a performance perspective um, as a sector, a sector that has been growing and a sector that is set to grow in the future. And then now that we have covered ETFs in general, chatted a bit about passive investing. I've tried to make the case for healthcare and explain to you various reasons why we believe it really is an attractive theme to be included in your portfolios. Now let's look at the actual ETF. So it's the Signia Artrix Selective Healthcare 150 ETF. If you want to look for the ETF, you will and if you're on a stockbroking account and the share code is SIG H, so H standing for healthcare. And what is this product about? Well, at a high level, it is a high risk, passively managed industry tracking fund. And its objective is to replicate the price and yield performance of the index. And the index is the Selective Developed Markets Healthcare 150 Index. The allocation will be 100% strategic allocation to global equities. So it will always be global markets that we are tracking. But which 150 stocks will be determined by the index provider? So the index will be balanced from time to time. To be exact, it rebalances four times a year in February, May, August, and November. And as the index rebalance, what we track will also will track exactly what's um, in the index. And the focus of this index is really on the largest 150, as the name suggests, the largest 150 healthcare companies in developed markets. Now, as much as it's 100% allocation to equities, so that's the reason why we describe it as a high risk fund. We know that investing in any equities, whether it's local or global, investing in equities is higher risk. We know that share prices move um, up and down throughout the day, from day to day, from year to year. And for that reason, it is suggested that you have a long-term time horizon. What you would want to avoid, um, not to say that you're stuck in it and you have to be invested for five years. It's a recommendation. Um, if you wanted to, you could buy today and sell it next week. Of course, the risk with any equities is that we know that share prices move up and down. It is seen as a riskier investment, but investment theory tells us that the higher the risk, the higher the return. That is why when you invest in growth assets, it is a good idea to have that long-term mindset because we do expect ups and downs and volatility along the way. And this ETF will come in at a total expense ratio of 50 basis points. So this is the cost of the fund. Now let's chat a little bit about the index. So very descriptive in the name. So from the name, Selective Developed Markets Healthcare 150 Index, we can already tell it's developed markets. So we're really focusing on developed markets here and on the 150 largest stocks. Why did we choose this index? We wanted the focus to be on developed markets. We truly believe that it is the healthcare companies in the developed economies that will drive the research and development behind the growth in the sector. And why not all the healthcare companies? Why, why just 150? Well, it really is the largest companies that have the available resources that are able to spend a lot on research and development. And when you're able to spend a lot on research and development, when you're able to hire the best scientists and clever people in the world to work for you, that is really those companies then are at the forefront of all the innovations that we are set to see in the healthcare space. 
And then at the bottom, again, you can just see since inception uh, what this index has performed at. Now, just to go back to that minimum investment period that's recommended of five years, essentially, if you invested back in July 2007, you were invested in four, for four years, can clearly see that your money would have grown, but what you want to avoid um, in the short term is you want to avoid, for example, if you can see my mouse, if you invested early in 2020 and you decided to take your money out somewhere in the middle of 2020, you do expect the ups and downs in the markets. And that, of course, was pandemic related and markets uh, really struggled in the first uh, half of 2020. There was a massive drawdown and a very quick recovery across um, all markets around the world. What you can expect in terms of um, exposure to various countries. So as much as the ETF is 100% global equities and all of these companies are healthcare companies, the risk of the fund is lowered in the sense that it is still a very diversified group of companies. So it's not as risky as investing in a single share. So you're buying one instrument, you've got exposure to 150 companies. So the risk is spread across the fact that you are tracking the performance of 150 companies. And in addition to that, there's different countries exposure. So you're not just exposed to just one country's healthcare stocks. It is largely weighted to the US. This should be no surprise as we know that some of the biggest and most successful pharmaceutical companies are US listed companies. So just over 68% of the total um, exposure would be to the US. The next highest allocation is to Switzerland. So 8.6% exposure will be to Switzerland followed by Japan at about 4.6% and Great Britain just under 4%. So it is diversified across different um, countries and currencies as well. Then we know that it will be 150 stocks, but which ones make up the top 10? So which would be the ones with the largest weightings? So these are the top 10 holdings as at the end of July. And as you look down the list, I have no doubt that you recognize a lot of the names, especially through the pandemic. We know that there's been such a focus on, I mean, it's been all over the news. You cannot get away from it, even if you want a break from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we can't help but hear all about the Johnson and Johnsons and the Pfizer's and people debating which vaccine and which medication um, can help with this disease. But as I said, uh, for us, investment into this healthcare sector you know, goes beyond this pandemic. So Johnson & Johnson, very well-known company, household names. I have no doubt that pretty much in everybody's house, there's some or other Johnson & Johnson product. United Health Group, another big company, Roche Holdings, Pfizer, Novartis, Abbott Laboratories, um, many, many, you know, good, well-known names that are part of your uh, top 10 holdings as at the end of July in this fund. And if we just have a look at some of these companies and what they're about. Well, I decided to start with Pfizer. I have absolutely no doubt that everybody knows who Pfizer is. Um, I also have no doubt that many of you have already received uh, your first jab and it's very likely to have been uh, a Pfizer vaccine. So Pfizer, massive company, been around for many, many years. They are not just in one country, they are their medications are sold in over 125 countries all over the world. They also manufacture medications at 43 sites worldwide. In 2020, they returned 8.4 billion US dollars to shareholders through cash dividends, and their revenue was just short of 42 billion rand. What do they anticipate for 2021? Well, they anticipate paying a strong dividend. And the thing about these companies is that they are continuously thinking of new products, ways to make healthcare better, cheaper, medications more efficient. And at the bottom, if you look at this timeline, this is their current projects. They've got 29 projects in phase one, uh, 40 in phase two development, 23 in phase three, and eight are just about ready to be registered. So over 100 different products that are in development at the moment. And from a revenue perspective, simply phenomenal. 
From 2016 to 2020, this uptick in revenue, although it looks almost flat, you know, revenue has been growing and in billions of US dollars. And look at what is projected for 2021, a massive jump to almost double the revenue from 2020 that was uh, 41.9 billion US dollars. At the end of 2021, this is projected to be anywhere between 78 and 80 billion US dollars. And a big portion of that, thanks to the COVID-19 vaccine that's being administered in many, many countries across the globe. Johnson & Johnson, another company very well known. As I said, I'm pretty sure everybody has a Johnson & Johnson product at home. We also know them because of the vaccine now, especially here in South Africa. It was actually the first vaccine to be used um, in the Sasanke trial of our healthcare workers. And now it is also available as a vaccine at a couple of vaccination sites. But vaccine aside, they invest billions of US dollars into research and development every year to think about new products, to think about making healthcare uh, better, easier, more accessible. And this year, they have actually got a breakthrough in terms of treatment for HIV. And we know that HIV affects almost 40 million people worldwide, and there's you know, new infections of that disease on a yearly basis as well. And what this new injection can do is uh, a person that has HIV can go for an injection once a month or hopefully once every two months. I believe they're still uh, you know, doing a lot of the testing on how you know, effective it is. And they can keep the virus under control without having to take that whole lot of uh, medication that usually HIV patients have to take. So this can be, uh, you know, a big game changer in terms of the day-to-day -day lives of people that live with HIV. And I have no doubt that if we have to talk about this again in a couple of years' time, there will be even more breakthroughs um, for this disease as well. And then another company I want to highlight is GHK. Their little orange logo is at the bottom. And again, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you are familiar with this um, company. And to describe it in one quick sentence, it would be, you can describe it as a science-led global healthcare company. They focus on three main areas, which is pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and consumer healthcare. And they have been named one of the top 10 most innovative companies in the biotech sector. And in the pharmaceutical part of their business, they have, you know, a lot of medications for various illnesses, also for HIV and other respiratory illnesses. And they also spend a lot of money for research and development to focus on, you know, human genetics, immunology, and all of these new advanced technologies. So what we see from them today is definitely not the full product suites. There's so much more um, in the pipeline. And when it comes to vaccines, they're actually the world's largest vaccine companies by revenue. And again, a lot of research development um, specifically focusing on vaccines against infectious diseases. And then consumer healthcare, they, you know, combine their consumer insights as well as their, uh, you know, clever knowledge on the various sciences. And they have many medications that um, can, you know, that people take in day-to-day -day life. And they also, you know, develop things such as, uh, you know, toothpastes that can uh, help in terms of oral health and expect it. In fact, if you look at this last little picture um, on the right hand side, these little blue vials, um, this is the product called Novamin, and it, this is really the key technology in the Sensodyne repair and protect. So they've got a very good, very well diversified business, and then looking ahead. They continue to innovate and we can ex continue uh, to expect a strong performance uh, from them going ahead. And then maybe a less known company, but I thought let me highlight it anyway. On every list, and you're welcome to you know, do your own research, but if you Google the top 10 most innovative companies in the healthcare space, um, Teladoc Health is pretty much on every list. Now, Teladoc Health is all about 
providing health care to individuals, but on a remote basis. So through various software, through apps, putting physicians and patients together. But it is not just focused on your usual day-to-day -day checkups. They've got a big focus on mental health. And mental health has, I'm sure, as you know, become increasingly more important, especially through the pandemic, as people have been alone, feeling isolated, potentially losing loved ones. There's been you know, a lot of bad news um, you know, everywhere, every time you switch on the TV. So mental health has become a big, big issue globally. And through these software and these apps, they can uh, really uh, connect uh, people that are struggling with their mental health with, uh, you know, mental health providers. And in between, there's, you know, many programs that will give you these self-guided uh, programs that you can follow in between your visits with your mental health practitioner. And it really is um, making a, a world of difference. And because it's a digital company, they also able to collect a lot of data and through the years they can study the trends and see what the impact of having this really low cost and accessible virtual care they can see what the impact is and just on mental health if you look here on the right hand side i've included the statistics that they have uh, gathered you know through their own data from these apps and the impact on mental health from virtual care is they found that 76% of patients had improved depression. So that depression has become better after three visits. 75% of patients had improved their anxiety after four visits. And then there was a massive reduction of over 55% in the overall depression score. And then the numbers on the left-hand side focus on just the benefits of virtual care because this isn't just about mental health you can also get primary care so you know you have the flu or you have the virus if you speak to your uh, physician the software is actually very powerful they can keep track of uh, you know all of your tests and the history of your body fancy charts so it's not just about connecting with that person but it's about having that easily accessible data and the powerful data at the physician's fingertips and they have found that since, you know, being able to um, launch the software and the software is now available to many individuals, to doctors, to hospital groups, to companies, they have found that there's a four times greater utilization than industry average when you have this low cost and easy option to connect to a physician. Um, and 92% of people's problems were resolved after first uh, visits and then the savings is really where it matters. So this is a company, it's seen as influential, it's seen as innovative because through digitizing this whole process, they are able to essentially uh, save costs for us as the consumers. And the average um, claim savings per visit, they have calculated it to be $472, which is simply massive. And as I mentioned, this company is not just about this connecting of patients and doctors. They also sell a lot of software. They sell a lot of devices and these virtual devices that can help um, in terms of remote care and remote uh, patient and uh, doctor consultation. So truly an innovative company, an influential company, and pretty much on every list as one of the most innovative healthcare companies. And then the last one I want to touch on is Intuitive Surgical. So a company that's very much focused on robotics. And one of the very popular devices is called the Da Vinci device. And if you look at the picture over here, you'll see what the first Da Vinci device that they prototyped back in uh, 1995 and 1996 looked like to what it looks like today. And so it's very small and sleek and essentially uh, somebody, a doctor operating can, you know, look through uh, these goggles, the picture on the right hand side, and they can with a lot of precision uh, view exactly where they're cutting and where they're making an incision. And then the data on the left hand side just shows you how many procedures worldwide are done using this Da Vinci device um, and how many countries have these Da Vinci systems. And they're also very well known for um, their 
eon angioluminal system, which enables biopsy of very small hard to reach modules. So this is used when cancer is suspected. And again, if you look at uh, some of these pictures, it really is bringing in that digital um, element to it where physicians can really you know, zoom in and really see what's going on in your body and with a lot of precision, uh, be able to biopsy a really, really small and hard to reach places in the bodies. So all very exciting. And these companies that I have highlighted are in part of these 150 that we will track. Um, and I'm personally very excited to see where the healthcare industry moves going ahead. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. We're just on 12 o'clock. So um, I will stay on for another few minutes and try and answer some of these questions. But um, it looks like I will be getting back to most of you on email. But the last question. So we've seen healthcare is attractive uh, from you know, growth prospects. We've seen there's a lot of innovation happening. Now there's this ETF that can track the performance of these 150 companies and really give you that uh, exposure to the global healthcare companies at 50 basis points. And the ETF is already available. Um, it's launched today on the JSC. Today is the 6th of August. And we will have a secondary listing on the secondary exchange called A2X. And that will uh, happen on the 17th of August. So you'll be able to buy and sell this ETF on A2X then only on the 17th of August. And before I end off, um, just including some of my favorite quotes for ETFs in general. And with ETFs, it really is about not looking for the needle in the haystack. So you're not looking, you know, is Pfizer going to be the one? Is GSK going to be the one that's going to perform over the next couple of years? Rather buy the whole haystack. So buy the whole ETF, have exposure to all 150 of them, and um, then you have exposure to that whole sector instead of trying to see exactly which company will give me the highest growth prospects. And as we're speaking about technologies and innovation, ETFs are fundamentally a technology. They're mechanisms to achieve a certain goal. And I like what this uh, Dave said from ETF.com. He said traditional mutual funds were the rotary phones and ETFs are smartphones. They do the same thing, but they do it in a much better package. And John Stain believes that ETFs will be the investable default for investors in the years to come. This makes sense. They're transparent, they're low cost, they're liquid, and it simply makes sense. And as we see the growth in AUM continues to grow globally in ETFs. So we know ETFs are not just having a moment, but they're creating a movement. And that was Martin Small from BlackRock, which is the biggest passive management firm in the world. So thank you very much for listening to me this morning. Let me try and take a few questions. Okay, the first question, very good question. How is this ETF different from the health unit trust? So broadly speaking, they are similar in the sense that they're both providing you with exposure to the healthcare sector. But the two products are quite different. So the first basic difference is the one is a unit trust, the other one is an ETF, so the mechanism is slightly different. The unit trust, the one that we launched last year, has a different benchmark. It's benchmarked against the MSCI Healthcare Index. The ETF will track the Selective Developed Markets Healthcare 150 Index, so different benchmark. Additionally, the unit trust is dynamically managed. You can almost view it it's not totally passive. It's not just going to track this index. We at Signia and our investment team can dynamically weight the portfolio to certain subsectors. So that could potentially include exposure to uh, cannabis stocks, for example, if they wanted to. Um, if they believe one subsector of healthcare might do better than the others, they can tilt the portfolio to be weighted more there. And another fundamental difference is as much as it's offshore now, the portfolio does allow for about 20% of the portfolio to be invested in South Africa. So it's not at the moment, but in a few years to come, you never know, maybe there's some great uh, and fabulous healthcare opportunities in South Africa. The unit trust can have 80% exposure to global markets and 20% exposure to uh, South African market, whereas the ETF 
by definition, has to track the index. The index is the select of Healthcare 150, a developed market Healthcare 150 index, and whatever is in that index is exactly what we'll track. We cannot say we don't like the stock out of the 150, we're not going to buy it, we're tracking that index. And it's 100% global equities. So those are at high level some fundamental differences between the two, but at the same time, they both follow the healthcare theme and they will both give you exposure to that growth uh, theme of global development or global, mostly developed markets healthcare. The next person asks which one is better. Well, that will depend on your personal preferences. If you if your focus is to truly be in always the largest, most liquid um, healthcare companies, they both have that flavor where they you know focusing on some of the big health. But um, if you want a purely index tracking one, then I say go for the ETF. But we you know, obviously believe in our own capabilities and we do believe that by dynamically weighting the unit trust, we can also add a lot of value. So if you really can't decide between the two, maybe a 50-50 exposure. Otherwise, I encourage you to log onto our website, read the fact sheets, read the marketing sheets, and of course, get in touch with us if you have any further questions. But both will give you very good global exposure to uh, the healthcare team. Next question, will this ETF qualify as a tax-free investment? Yes, it will. A lot of questions about the differences between the Health Innovation Fund and this ETF. I hope that I have answered this question and please do get in touch with me if you are unsure on the differences. Someone is asking about our plans to launch two more ETFs. That is very true. We are launching um, one ETF that will focus on a certain growth region that we're very excited about and another one that's very technology focused. Um, so that's exciting. Um, these ETFs do take a little bit of time from the time that we think them up to the times that we can actually offer them to um, investors when they're already listed on the stock exchange. So I'm not sure if we'll still see them in 2021, but if not 2021, it will be early in 2022. Um, someone is asking if I can show the slide of the past performance again. You will receive, um, in the interest of time, you will receive a, 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 this recording. So now that you've attended the session, you will receive a copy of the recording and you can go through the slides then. But if it's a particular slide, then please uh, email me and then I can send you uh, that particular slide uh, for yourself. Another question about tax-free savings account. Um, the companies, can, please could you list the companies in the regions that the ETF incorporates? So I covered the regional exposure, largely weighted about 68.3% to the US. Um, second to that will be Switzerland, after that Japan, um, and then Great Britain. Um, if at any stage you are curious about the, you know, which companies are in there, we do include in ETF, as you know, one of the benefits is transparency. If you log onto our website and you find the Signia Artrix range, if you click on an ETF, it can be the S&P 500, can be the Fourth Industrial Revolution Fund. If you click onto that ETF on the right-hand side, you'll be able to view the NAV performance as well as the constituents. So once this uh, ETF is now live, you will be able to you know, go onto the website, um, in a few days time. And then from there on, it will be on a daily basis. So for some of the ETFs that we've had going for quite a while, you can now log on and you can view the full uh, constituents list there. So the JSC code for this ETF is SIGH, S-Y-G-H. And I see that we're almost going to 10 minutes over time. So I think I will take the rest of these questions and answer them on email. As I'm scrolling through, I am seeing a lot of the same questions about tax-free savings differences um, to the unit trust, but I will go through every single one of these and respond to you. So I want to thank you again for all of you that have especially stuck around for these 10 minutes extra. 
to listen to the answers for the questions. So thank you for joining me. We are extremely excited to have this 13th ETF now live. I hope you find it exciting uh, from a theme perspective and please do get in touch with us if you have any further questions. Thank you.